This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. But our scripture lesson today is coming from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 6 through 12 in the New Living Translation. Notice there these words. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth, and he says, If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so because I'd be telling the truth. But I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. And three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. My grace is sufficient for you. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. We're talking today from the subject, the never-ending war. The never-ending war. This is the Apostle Paul struggling with his flesh saying that there was sent unto him a messenger of Satan. And let me just tell you, this thorn in the flesh, the thorn in the flesh, a thorn in your side, is not generally just directly a demon spirit. It's always a person. If you ever have somebody that's a pain in the neck, a pain in your flesh, thorn in your flesh, it's talking about a person that the devil is using to get them underneath your skin. Now just to make it plain. And the Apostle Paul is saying that because of the abundance of revelation that he was given, you see, he, was, he had just finished describing a situation where he said that he had been taken up in, into the third heaven. And he didn't really know whether he was in the flesh or in the spirit or where he was, but he says that because of the abundance of the revelation that, was, that he was given, that he was given a thorn in the flesh. God wanted to say that, you know, though I have gifted you, I'm going to uh, let great gifting also come with a great thorn, with something in your flesh to remind you that you are not God. It leaves, it's, it's your Achilles heel. It is something that reminds you of your humanity because you could start smelling yourself and start thinking that you are God's gift to the whole world but the gift is wrapped in this flesh and you have issues and you have limitations and you have insecurities that you will never fully graduate from on this planet and he says that yes I'm going to use you yes you're gifted yes you're called yes you are anointed but there's been a sign to you a messenger of Satan to buffet you. To buffet means to give one blow after another. Have you ever felt buffeted in your life? To where before you can recover from one thing, here, something else hits you. As soon as you pay this off and you think you got some extra money coming in, now here something else breaks down. How many of you have been there before and you, you, you realize, you know, it's always something. It's always something. It's the messenger of Satan that keeps getting up underneath your skin aggravating you, terrorizing you, frustrating you, reminding you of your limitations and of your humanity and ultimately of your dependence on God. Because if God gifted you with too much giftings, you start feeling like you were celestial. Like you some angels, like you got some kind of special power, like you the golden child. But God says, you know what, I'm, I'm going to leave something in your flesh. I'm going to bless you, but I'm going to leave something in your flesh. You remember when Jacob wrestled with an angel? He got blessed. I mean, bless, it blessed his socks off. It blessed his socks off so much that, that his, his name was changed from Jacob, which means supplanter. It means trickster. It means deceiver. 
And the angel transformed his nature from being this deceiver, this trickster, this con artist, to becoming Israel, now prince with God. And he wrestled with God. He had, an, he had a vision of, of, of an angel, of God, and wrestled with this God. And all of a sudden now, his name gets changed because he said, I am not going to turn you loose until you bless me. But when he touched him, the angel caused uh, the sinew in the hollow of his thigh to shrivel up so that the Bible says that he walked with a limp for the rest of his days to remind him of his humanity. He's got a limp. What is it that you've done that is nothing but your limp? It didn't paralyze you. God said, you're going to keep on moving, but I'm going to leave something in you that's going to let everybody who meets you notice something happened and it tried to take you out, but you're still here. He said, I, I'm going to leave a limp in you and, 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 and it's going to show people that you touch the divine, but there are consequences to touching the divine while you still have the limitation of flesh. And he said, I just want to remind you that there was given unto me a thorn in my flesh because I, I still got this limp. This thing is still on my record. It's, it's still in, in my past. It's still haunting me in my memory, but I know I've been touched by God. It touched him to the degree that his name was changed and God did something in his nature that left him where he was never the same. But isn't it interesting that the God who so loved this man chose not to change his identity in history. And so he decided to be known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not Israel. I thought he changed his name. He did. But God says... I didn't just come to be identified with the divine part of you. I came to be identified with the human part of you. But your Jacob that you'll wrestle with all of the days of your life, it's the never-ending battle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know he changed his name from, from Jacob to Israel, but then you see him in the 48th chapter of the book of Genesis in verse 2. That when his son came, they told him, hey, they said, hey, Joseph is here. Joseph is his Abraham, Isaac. Jacob, Jacob had these sons. Jacob, Joseph was his favorite boy. When they told him, they came to Jacob while Jacob was in the bed. And the Bible said Israel sat up and strengthened himself. He's talking to Jacob. And in the same verse, it calls him both Jacob and Israel. It says when they told Jacob that his son Joseph was there, the Bible says Israel strengthened himself and sat up in the bed. Israel was the God part that had to bless his son, Joseph, and his two boys, Ephraim and Manasseh. And he sat up, but he left that nature. And, and, and I thought that when he had this encounter in the wilderness with the angel, I thought that was the end of Jacob. But we still see Jacob on his deathbed. It was a never-ending war. Though he was Israel, he still wrestled with Jacob. Though you're saved, if somebody pushes your buttons, you still remember the language of Egypt. I've been hearing a lot of Egypt come out of people that are supposed to be in the promised land. I mean, they are fluent in Egyptian. It's a never ending battle. It's a never ending battle. And may I just tell you here that it reminds us that we are supposed to forever have a dependence on God. He never wants you to graduate to the degree that you don't need God. He always wants us to depend on him. And uh, Paul realized that God was more concerned about his development than his comfort. Please don't think that God hates you, that he's being mean to you if he leaves you in an uncomfortable situation. I want you to understand this, that the only thing that grows in the comfort zone is mediocrity. That's why God won't leave you in a comfortable place too long because the only thing that grows in the comfort zone is mediocrity. And when God is trying to develop you, you're gonna be made to feel uncomfortable. If you're training to be a champion, you're gonna to have to come out of your comfort zone and lay down the things that are comfortable and get uncomfortable for a season so that you can grow. You only grow when you go through the corridor of challenge and controversy and then you will grow 
And we see that Jacob wrestled with this all of his life. But the truth of the matter is, is that muscles are actually built through resistance. When you go in a gym, it's because you put resistance against your muscles that you're actually able to build up that muscle. It's through resistance. Strength is built through resistance. Strength is built through resistance. My wife and I had bought these wonderful things lying up in the bed and we attached these uh, things to our abs, you know, to give us a six pack, an eight pack. And you could just, just, it sent an impulse, an electrical impulse and it contracted the muscles. We're lying up in the bed eating donuts. <laughs> My wife had hers on full blast, just. <laughs> but I discovered that it was a comfort zone. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I would sometimes love to just drop my body off at the gym and pick it up after it's finished. But you have to go through this terrible corridor called discomfort if you're going to be developed and there must be resistance. And there sometimes has to be somebody there that is coaching you through the discomfort saying, come on, give me five more. Come on, four more. Come on, three more. When we had given out, at the time that they start saying, come on, give me five more. It's like, I, I just, that was my last one. <laughs> but it's not until they call for more and you become uncomfortable. When you start shaking, that's when you start making it. When you start breaking it down so you can build it up. That's what's happening. And this is why Paul said that when I'm weak, then am I strong. Because he's put me in a place out of my comfort zone. The Holy Ghost doesn't go to work until you get out of your comfort zone. The Holy Spirit does not work in a comfort zone. I'm sorry. He doesn't work. He'll tell you to go and do something and he's not going to tell you what's going to happen. Just go trust me. And you trust it and trembling and scared the whole time. And you're out of your comfort zone. And the Holy Ghost will swoop in and move when you didn't know how this thing was going to turn out. He just says, trust me, trust me, trust me, trust me. And remember, Jesus taught us something about it in Mark chapter 11 and verse 23. He says, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, not doubt in his heart. He didn't say not doubt in your head because your head will always doubt what you're believing for in your heart. And here's the principle. You can get God to still move for you with doubt in your head, but faith in your heart. Because every time I have believed God for something that was supernatural, I had faith in my heart and my head start doubting and said, what if it doesn't happen? There have been times that God said to lay your hands on them. And when you do so, the sickness will come out of them. Every demon will come out of them and I will heal them. And I'm, 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 I lay my hand in obedience and, and, and the devil says to me, nothing is going to happen when you do that. But I press beyond what the devil is saying. My head is doubting, but I'm, I'm following the faith that's in my heart. You can still get God to work for you with faith in your heart and doubt in your head. Your head is designed to doubt what your heart believes because the head is doing what it's ordained to do. It's designed to doubt things to try to keep you safe. So you don't go out and start eating snake berries that are poisonous and said, hey, this stuff could kill me. And so if you didn't have your head doubting certain things, you'd have killed yourself a long time ago. Your head will say, hey, no, 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 slow down. No, no, no. But I want you to know that your heart knows stuff that your head does not know. My dad had told me about an experience, how he brought this girl home one time to meet his mother. He said his mother never said a word. She looked over her glasses at him. <laughs> and when she took that little hussy out of there, she said, don't ever bring her back here no more. My grandmother didn't know anything about this woman, but her heart knew something. Her heart knew something. Listen, that woman was not my mama. <laughs> my grandmother knew something. She, she, hadn't, she didn't know anything about this girl. But somehow, them old saints, they could look at you. And they could discern your spirit and say, she ain't right. He ain't right. Don't fool with him. They don't have to know the history. Oh, mama, he got a good job. I, I. They don't care anything about the resume. That heart tells them, listen, baby, something in the milk ain't clean. They just, they didn't, they just have to, and, and she, was, she was discerning something in her heart that her head knew nothing about. But I'm just telling you, you can still get God to work for you with faith in your heart and doubt in your head because God begins to speak to your heart out of the 
heart come the issues of your life out of your heart. And that's why you'll never be able to please God by always walking by your head knowledge. So God will limit your capacity to see, to think, to understand when you just walk by your head alone. You've got to have your heart engaged. And if you believe God in your heart, though your head will doubt it, follow your heart. Follow your heart and, uh, and the, the, the leading of the Holy Spirit because he's going to speak to your heart. Your flesh can get you in trouble. And everybody's flesh leads them in, into different kinds of places. But let me just remind you of this, that when we meet temptation, we can do two things. You can run from it or you can face it. Joseph chose to run from the temptation when Potiphar's wife grabbed a hold of him. Because you don't try to rationalize and negotiate with sexual temptation. Now he could have told her, Miss, Miss Potiphar, I know your husband is out of town. And uh, it would probably be better if you sort of covered your cleavage a little bit. And I think if you would maybe stand back just a little bit, this would be uh, much more, you know, conducive to our keeping a very professional relationship. <laughs> but he didn't negotiate with her. He didn't just try to say, you know, we're just going to, you know, just still stay in each other's presence. And, you know, I'll stay on my side and you'll stay on yours. You can't negotiate with your flesh. It'll take over with you. You cannot walk into the refrigerator at 11 o'clock at night looking at cheesecake and fried chicken. <laughs> pound cake. You, you, just, you just can't do it. And you're on a health kick. You're trying to lose weight. You, you, you've got some, you, can, you cannot have that conversation standing there looking at the glistening of perfectly golden brown fried chicken because it'll call your name you can't stand there looking at ice cream it'll call your name you don't negotiate with sin you flee but you close the door but bypass it avoid it see the scripture says flee temptation it, it doesn't say negotiate with it. So whenever it comes to you, you run from it or you face it. There are certain things that you can never overcome until you're willing to confront it. You can't run from everything, but both of them are actually forms of resistance. Both of them are forms of resistance. Both are forms of resistance. And here's what I want you to realize is that trials are generally external issues and event, but temptations are internal struggles. Whenever you get tempted, it's generally an internal struggle. It's an internal issue. And here's what I want you to understand further, is that if we are not careful, the external test may become internal temptation, and we will find ourselves complaining against God, questioning God's love for us, believing that God is angry with us, or even resisting God's will. So if we're not careful, these external tests can become internal temptation and you'll find yourself complaining against God. You'll find yourself questioning God's love for you or believing that God is angry with you or you'll start resisting God's will. But please understand this. You will never ever win the war of the flesh with willpower alone. I know you got strong willpower. I know you're determined. I know you're a person of resolve. But you will always need the Holy Spirit's help. And it'll be a struggle even with the Holy Spirit's help. Please, <clears throat> it still doesn't make it a, a, a piece of cake. I just want to be honest with you. Uh, Galatians chapter 5 here, verse 16 through 21. Notice what the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Galatia. He says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces, notice this, are constantly fighting each other so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the, Holy, by the Spirit, you are not under the obligation of the, uh, to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling. Notice that quarreling is a work of the flesh. 
That's why you can't cast out a spirit of quarreling. Notice jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness. Do you know drunkenness is a work of the flesh? That's why you can't cast out a spirit of drunkenness. It's a work of the flesh. Wild parties, revelers, and other sins like these. He says, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. That these are problematic things that where your flesh will have been overtaken and you've just yielded to the flesh. And isn't it interesting that all the, the apostle Paul had supernatural, uh, he had had a supernatural encounter with Jesus Christ and been converted on the road to Damascus. You know how he saw a, 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 you know, a bright light and he heard, they heard thunder and, and he was blind for three days and, and he was converted. You know the, uh, Paul's Damascus road experience. He would had this experience and he was persecuting Christians and now he got on fire for, for Jesus. But you know, he still had a trouble with his flesh. The Apostle Paul still had trouble with his flesh. It's a never-ending war. I never understood this, you know, until I, I was uh, growing up in a church and, and my pastor was considerably older than I. And so he, he was still pastoring at 85 years old. And I, I would hear him preaching in the, in the Bible and, and, and he said, uh, he was talking about sexual temptation and, and, and he, said, he said Samson couldn't stand it. He said David couldn't stand it. He said Solomon couldn't stand it. And he went down this litany of people through the scriptures who just failed at sexual temptation. And then he said, and I'm 85 years old and I can't stand it. <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm like, dude, you, I, I mean, and I'm, I was a teenager nearly at, at the time. And, and, and he's in his 80s and, uh, and, he, and he couldn't stand it. At my first pastorate, I, I reached out to him. I said, I want you to come to my installation. I was 27 years old. And I was being installed as a pastor. And he came to pray the prayer of dedication. And he came and he gave some remarks. And he forgot to pray the prayer of dedication. He was, he was nearly 90 years old at this time. And somebody said, they said, Dr. Borders, they said, you forgot to pray. And he said, you're looking at a prayer. <laughs> It's amazing that when you walk with God, it's not what you say. Prayer is an attitude of your heart. And people, when they look at you, can't really tell whether you're praying or not. You can be washing dishes in, 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 in high prayer meeting, folding clothes, and in high prayer meeting. You can be cooking dinner and in the middle of intercession for your children or your spouse. Anybody know what I'm talking about? He said, you're looking at a prayer. Prayer is not always what you do with your lips. It's what you do with your life. But I want you to see here, here's the apostle Paul. After all of his divine encounter with Jesus, he met Jesus not by the flesh. He met Jesus by the spirit, by revelation. And this is why Paul said that there was given to him a messenger of Satan to buffet him. That every place that Paul went there was demonic trouble stirred up against him on every job that he went in, every city that he went. There he was arrested, he was beaten, he was shipwrecked, he was dealt with sleeplessness. He dealt with a wide variety of ills trying to do God's will. And whoever told you in your own naive thinking concerning Christianity that if you gave your heart to Jesus, you wouldn't have any trouble and you'd live happily ever after. That's a fairy tale kind of thing. This is life 101, and God is saying that I will be with you in the good times and in the bad times, and I'll use your ups and your downs and your positives and your negatives. And He's saying that I will even take the mess of your past and I'll use that as fertilizer for what I'm going to grow in your future. God is saying that I never waste even the hurt and the mistakes and the shame and the embarrassment and the sin that you have done. I will take even that and use that as a teaching curriculum to those that you're going to be able to deliver out of the same grasp of saying, hey baby, I've already been down that road. Let me show you how to get out of that. Let me show you how to avoid this. Let me help you to see because I can smell that. I know that type. I don't know his name. I don't know her name, but I know the type. I have already been there and I'm trying to save you what I've already been through and you just have to sometimes just begin to pray. I remember when my oldest brother was about to make a mistake and my mama, she knew it. She's getting ready to marry somebody and my mama knew it. You know, I don't know how these mamas know it, but these mamas know. 
Mamas can look at somebody and tell them when he ain't no good and when she ain't no good. And mama knew something was wrong. My brother was headstrong though. He was a chemist and he, he knew it. He knew it all. You couldn't tell him anything. So my mother called me. And she said, I want you to come and lay your hands on him. <laughs> and I went and I laid my hands on him. And I said, God, if he's making a mistake, don't let him rest night nor day until you've manifested your will in his life. Don't let him be able to sleep. Three days later, he'd already sent the invitations out for the wedding. First time in my life that I'd ever seen anybody have to send a retraction notice out, but he did. Because <laughs> after he couldn't sleep that third night, he called the wedding on. He said, something must be to this. And he called it on. It wasn't what I talked out, it's what I prayed in. And I'm just telling you, sometimes your spirit knows things that your head doesn't know. And sometimes when they won't listen, you got to, you got to trump something. You got to go to spiritual power. Because that flesh was so encumbered and so blinded when they've been entangled by the flesh. You walk in the spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the of the flesh because there's a way that appears right unto a man and the end of that is destruction but I'm telling you if you've ever got spiritual folks folks that's woke in the spirit in the spirit to the right things of God it makes a difference and I want you to notice here what the apostle Paul writing to the church at Rome this is the same Paul now that had already had a Damascus Road experience and he'd been converted and his life is committed and submitted to Jesus and he's still having trouble with his flesh he's an apostle of the Lord and has a super abundance of revelation and with all of his spiritual self and Paul said I thank God that I speak in tongues more than thee all he was spiritually gifted tongue talk at all of that and I want you to see the trouble that he was having with his flesh Romans chapter 7 verse 14 notice this so the trouble is not with the law for it is spiritual and good the trouble is with me Paul was woke <laughs> He said, the trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. This is the apostles talking. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what's right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that I am doing what is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature, in my flesh. I want to do what's right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Anybody sound like somebody you know? But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing it. Oh yeah, pass that buck. It is sin living in me. That does it. Yeah, the devil made me do it. I have discovered this principle in life. Notice what he said. I've discovered that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war, that never ending war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? He's just asking a question. But then notice what he says. Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. You see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Paul is just saying... I'm a human being and I am subject to my flesh. I still, no matter how spiritual I am, no matter how many, how many letters that I write to the saints, no matter how much I pray, no matter how much I read scripture, he's saying, I still have flesh. I'm still a human being and I am subject. I never graduate to where I am impervious to the temptations of, to the flesh. He says, I'm a human being. And this is my humanity. And the only thing that gives me victory over this is my submission to Jesus Christ who paid the price for me. Because here's the issue. Is that when you get saved, your flesh does not get redeemed. Your flesh is still flesh. Your flesh will still want to do dirty things even after you're saved. Even after you're saved. That's why you have to discipline the flesh. That's why you have to pray. 
there was a mother that uh, prayed for her child because she saw his life going in a wayward direction. And you know, when a mother begins in, a, in desperation in her heart to begin to lay holes on the horns of the altar and to cry out for her children and something on the inside of her, she knew that there was a destiny that was in her son that was bigger than what he had any vision to be able to realize at the time. And she began to pray, God, God deal with him. Save my son. Save my son. He was, he was in drunkenness in his 20s. He'd come home drunk nearly every day. And he's staggering home drunk one day. And all of a sudden he passes by a garden and there are children there playing a game. And, and there in that garden they were hollering a phrase back and forth to each other. The same phrase, tolelegi, 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 tolelegi. And they would holler that tolelegi and they'd say tolelegi. And it literally means pick up and read or take up and read. And here this drunken man coming out of a drunken stupor staggering home from a bar in the daytime and he's hearing this tolelegi tolelegi pick up and read and all of a sudden he cast his eyes down in that garden and there was a new testament and he picks up the new testament and just lets it fall open to some place randomly and when it fell open randomly those words penetrated his heart and he had a conversion experience right there on the spot and gave his life to Jesus Christ just by the power of the word. And let me just show you, share with you the words that he, that he had. It was Romans chapter 13, verse 13 and 14. Notice what it said. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness. And he was drunk. And he, the Bible falls open randomly to this passage, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. And that's all he was thinking about. And these words came like penetrating arrows into his heart and he realized this is not a coincidence that I'm walking at this time of the day and I'm hearing children sing out, Tolelegi, tolelegi, pick up and read. And now I, my eyes fall on a Bible, a New Testament, and I pick it up. And it falls open to Romans 13, 13, and 14. And it speaks to me about my own debauchery and my own drunkenness. And he realized God is up to something. And he surrendered his life to the Lord Jesus at that point. And he eventually became the Bishop of Hippo. We know him as Aurelius Augustine. Saint Augustine. And thank God that he had a praying mother. That when he was out in his debauchery of sleeping around with various women and his drunkenness, that his mother prayed for him. Because sometimes talking to your children doesn't get the job done. But when you talk to Jesus, <laughs> the one that is able to override this flesh and come in and penetrate right where you are. Tole Legi, pick up and read. Tole Legi. Tolelegi, pick up and read, pick up and read. You'll be surprised how God can supernaturally and divinely guide your life in a way that becomes glorifying to him. It's amazing. And I want you to understand this, that sanctification is a process. And that process is about growth in Christ-like character. It is a process, a process that is about growth in Christ-like character. So you're saved, but you grow in sanctification. It's like riding a bicycle. You have to keep pedaling or you fall. And I want you to realize that when he begins to bring us into various experiences, just like Jesus in his 40 days of temptation in the scriptures, his first temptation was a temptation of his identity. If you are the son of God, what do you mean if? How dare you try to make the son of God question his identity? Because if the devil can make you forget who you are, it's easy for him to get you to misbehave. Whenever you lose sight of your real identity as to who you are, you will inevitably misbehave. So he came to try to confuse his identity. You see, before you cross the line, the devil blurs the line. And he blurred it, trying to confuse Jesus. If you are. The Son of God, how dare you throw that little two-letter word in to ship, cast doubt into the mind of the Son of God. That was the test of identity. Then he, he, he presented to him a performance test. Turn 
these, bread, these stones into bread. Try to perform. Perform. Do this. No, no, no. In, in, in Jesus, God has an order. You have to be before you do and do before you have. And he's telling to perform. You don't get acceptance with God through performance. You get per, uh, acceptance with God by your being. You be right with God. It is our accepting the grace of God in our life that sets a person a right with God so that you can be right and your doing right comes out of the nature of who you be who you are you must be before you do and do before you have and our problem in our culture is that we always try to have stuff that we've not done and do stuff that we've not yet first become if I am love I will love and I'll do loving things you don't just do loving things and then prove that. You have to, these things flow out of your being. If you are a kind person, it has, you have to be kind. You can't teach mean people to be kind. They can fake and deceive you, but up underneath that is still a ravenous wolf, wolf that's pretending to be a meek, mild sheep. You can't teach a wolf to be a sheep. Your nature will come out. It's who you are. The third test that the devil brought to Jesus was a presumption test. It was, a, it was presumption. Throw yourself down from here. Be presumptuous here. Do you know the Bible teaches us something about presumptuous sins in Psalm chapter 19 and verse 13? Notice this. The psalmist is praying. He says, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. He's praying, then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Please, he says, keep your servant from presumptuous sin. Presumptuous sin is willful sin. It's intentional sin. It's deliberate sin. It is planned sin. Uh, presumptuous sin is when you make your own plans and then ask God to come in and bless it. Instead of seeking to do it God's way. You presume that it's okay with him and you just go ahead and do what you want to do. That's a presumptuous sin. But God is God and, 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 and God's ways are higher than ours. So when you presume that your way is better than God's, that you can choose better than God can choose for you. See, the will of God is not something that you decide. It's something that you discover. You discover on the journey. And God wanted to make us curious enough to go on a search so that we discover the things that he has hidden on the journey for us. This thing is a very royal and a divine treasure hunt. And it grieves the heart of God when God has hidden treasure for you and you're too lazy to get up and go look for it. Go searching for it. You're too in love with security to go after the thing that will really make you come alive. How do we effectively deal with the sins of the flesh? Let me just give you a few simple things. Number one, consider yourself like a dead person. Because dead people don't suffer with sin. Consider yourself like a dead person. Romans chapter 6, verse 5 through 7, and then verse 11. Notice this. Paul writing to the church at Rome. He says, since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power its power in our lives we are no longer slaves to sin for when we died with Christ we were set free from the power of sin so you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus reckon yourself dead because dead people are not tempted to eat ice cream at night <laughs> Here's number two, crucify the deeds of the flesh. Crucify the deeds of the flesh. Not merely the flesh, crucify the deeds, the works of the flesh. F Romans chapter 8 verse 13, notice. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Kill the deed, not the body. Kill the deeds, not the body. The misdeeds of the body, you'll live. Notice Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 and 23. Throw off your old sinful nature. You know the one that would cuss people out at the drop of a hat with your Egyptian language? He says, throw off that old nature and your former way of life. Your, your, you know, you slap me, I'm going to slap you. Which is corrupted by lust and deception. Notice that. Your old life was full of lust and deception. 
Instead, he says, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. That brings us to number three, renew your mind and your thinking with the word of God. Renew your mind and thinking with the word of God. Romans chapter 12, verse two, notice this. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of the world. It's so crazy that I see so many churches trying to be like the world, thinking that that's going to make the world want to be like them. And, and the scripture is very clear. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. In other words, renew your mind with God-centeredness and not self-centeredness. Stop being the center of your own universe. It's a great sign of immaturity. Center, say, what, what does God think about this? How will this reflect on God and his kingdom if I do such and such? Here's number four. Confess your failure and sin daily. Confess that. Confess it. Sin goes out of the life by one way. It is through confession. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. Notice, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful. He's faithful. He's not judgmental. I'm going to send you to hell. If you confess your sins to him. Notice, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness, all unrighteousness. He doesn't just forgive us, he cleanses us from the thing that keeps driving us back to it. He cleanses us. He cleanses. He forgives us and cleanses us. He forgives us and cleanses us. You know, when we have fellowship with one another, then he cleanses, he cleanses. There's something about that that helps to cleanse us. That brings us to number five. Surround yourself with a few godly people who can challenge you and help keep you on track. Hebrews 3.13, notice this. You must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and harden against God. Surround yourself. Listen, you don't need a crowd, you need a crew. You just need a crew. You know, a work crew can be two or three people. You just need a crew so to help keep you on track. Because sometimes you, you, you get crazy ideas in your mind. You need to run it by somebody who's rooted and grounded in godliness. That's a part of your crew that can help you to stay on the right track. Because they'll tell you some things. Here's number six. Fight your impulses with discipline. You cannot just give yourself over to every impulse, everything that you feel. That's a comfort zone. And it'll lead you down a path of destruction. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27, notice. The apostle Paul said, I discipline my body like an athlete. I have to discipline. God said, I'm going to come in and discipline your body for you. You have to discipline. He says, I, I, I keep my body under subjection. That's the uh, King James Version. I keep my body under subjection. Uh, you know, so I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. It's not going to do what it wants, you know, what it, what, what it really wants to do naturally. You have to train it. Otherwise, he says, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself may be disqualified. He said, I have to discipline myself. I cannot live by the impulses of my flesh. Here's number seven. Realize that there is a reward for enduring temptation. Please understand with temptation, all temptation is temporary. Temporary. If I can only last through the temptation, it will pass. This too shall pass. Whenever you attempt it, this too will pass. This too will pass. This too will pass. It has a death date. James chapter 1 verse 12 and 13. Notice, blessed is the one who perseveres. Perseveres. That means you got to endure it. Perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. That's a crown of life. There is a crown of life. And notice, when tempted, no one should say that God has tempted me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Whenever you're being tempted, you know it's demonic. Here's number eight. Think of the consequences of yielding to temptation. Think of the consequences of yielding to temptation. The consequences. The devil never shows you the consequences. He only shows you the fun. He never shows you, you know, yeah, don't, you know, I know your mama said to be home at six, but you know, you ain't got to be home at six. He shows you the, the fun that you'll have, but he won't show you the consequences of being disobedient. He never shows it, you the consequences. That is a consequence of sin. Romans 6, 23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death. That's a consequence. It's death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through G Christ Jesus, our Lord. Please understand this, the torment of the temptation 
to sin is nothing to compare with the torment of the consequences of sin. I know it's tormenting to say, you know what? Oh, boy, this is, it, he's putting me under a lot of pressure. She's putting me under a lot of pressure. But you know what's worse? I wonder if I have a disease now. I wonder if I'm pregnant. I'm wondering if she's pregnant. The consequences of the, the, the torment of the consequences of sin is far greater than the torment of the temptation to sin. Think about the consequences. Think about the consequences. And please understand this principle, that you have the right to choose your actions, but you do not have the right to choose the consequences. You have the right to choose your actions, but you don't have the right to choose the consequences. The consequences are already built into the sin. It's already built into it. The minute that you eat the whole container of ice cream, with all 5,238 calories. It's already built into it. It's not that you get cursed with it. It's already in it. It's already in it. And once it gets in you, it's just going to do what it do. It's already in it. It's already in it. It's like you're eating snake berries. They're poisonous. They'll kill you. He says, don't eat it. He's not saying that if you eat this, I'm going to kill you because you ate it. He's saying it'll kill you if you eat it. And I'm trying to protect you from eating it. It has sorrow in it. It has regret in it. It has pain in it. He says, don't do this. I'm trying to save you. Don't fool with him, girl. You're going to wish you had never met him. It's a, please. God won't make you do right, but he sure will make you wish you had done right. He really will. He really will. He will. Here's number nine. Consider God's goodness whenever you're being tempted. Consider God's goodness. Consider God's goodness. Romans chapter 2 verse 4. People think that God's a mean God and he's going to strike you down every time you get ready to do something. Notice what Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? He's just saying, you know, God's good. God loves you. His mercy, his grace that is extended to you. He's not trying to kill you. He's trying to show you his kindness so that it will lead you toward repentance. To lead you toward repentance. A Sunday school child explained temptation to sin this way. Just a Sunday school boy. He says, two men live in my heart, the old Adam and Jesus. And he says that when temptation knocks at the door, somebody has to answer. And he says, if Adam answers, I will sin. But if Jesus answers, I will win. And we have Adam and the last Adam, Jesus Christ, and both of them live here. And if you'll send Jesus, the last Adam, to the door, you'll win every time. Yeah. And I know that it might seem like a daunting task to try to always feel as though you are able to overcome all of the sin that is in the world and every temptation that will come to you. And let me just say to you, without encouraging anybody to sin, nobody needs encouragement to sin. It's already in your mortal bodies. It is subject to it. That sometimes you'll lose a battle with sin, but you can still win the war. And you can ask God, God, please take this away from me so that I'm never tempted with this again. But God doesn't just take away all of the temptation. It's going to be a fight. It's going to be a struggle. You know what your weakness is. Everybody's is not sexual sin. Some people's weakness is, is lying. Some people's weakness is gossip. They just, you know, they, they, they can't wait to vomit on somebody. Some people's weakness is because they, they think that they're above the law. and they, it's some, Their weakness is spiritual pride, self-righteousness. People struggle with different things. 
And may I tell you this? I found that the internal sins of the heart are worse than the sins of the flesh. It's easier for me to get a prostitute saved who's been turning tricks with her body than to get a person who has pride and rebellion in their heart. Those are real wicked witches and warlocks to try to deal with because those are the hidden sins. For you can look all sanctified on the outside. You're really sanctimonious. You look like you're the right thing, but inwardly, you're ravenous wolves. And so you can still lose some battles, but still win the war because thanks be unto God who gives us the victory. And you can be praying, Lord, take, please take this thorn. Please, please, God, please, please. God says, I, w- I want you to depend on me because when you're weak, I'm strong. Let me be your strength. Let me be the one that sometimes because you're carrying something is too much for you. But if another person just comes and gets on the other end, it somehow makes something that was unbearable for you now able to be carried fairly easily because you've got, you got a helper, a comforter, the one called alongside to help, a paracletus, called alongside to help you. So that every time that you... You sin that you, the Greek word is hermartia. It means literally to miss the mark. It's an archery term. And every time you miss that mark, God has already thought about that. And that's why his son Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world to take away the sins of the whole world. He knew we would miss the mark. And I'm so grateful for the word of God. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Notice what he says. My dear children... I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. Thanks be unto God. Now listen, how can you lose when God the Father is the righteous judge and our defense attorney is the son of the judge? A good lawyer is one that knows the law. A great lawyer is one who knows the judge. And your defense attorney is the son of the judge, the father who sits on the throne, who is pulling for you and has granted you mercy. He's already granted you clemency. He already knew that you were going to mess up and get strung out and meet Agent 54 from hell itself. He already knew it. And he had already has an advocate for the father saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he's saying, God, can you imagine that the dad who is on the bench as the judge has his own son as the advocate that comes to the scene of the crime? And Jesus, as our defense attorney, reaches in his bag of tricks and takes his own blood and cleans our fingerprints from the scene puts his fingerprints there in our place so that now he changes place with us and when the evidence is examined he is found guilty on our behalf and he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we through his are you getting what I'm trying to tell you today I'm talking about an advocate that would say put whatever penalty that was to come on them on me and I will pay the price I will pay the price and the price was death and Jesus paid the price but thanks be unto God he said I am the resurrection and the life if any man liveth and believeth in me he will never die and though he were dead yet shall he live I'm glad today that we've got an advocate who removed 
our incriminating evidence from the scene and put his own prints there and said, lay it to my charge. Put it on me. I'll be the scapegoat. I'll be the lamb that will take away the sins of the whole world. And everything that was supposed to come to them, the penalty of death that was supposed to come to them, I'll pay it for them. I love them. I believe in them. I'm dying for them so that they can live for me. And I declare to you today, Jesus died for you for every time that you would miss the mark. And if you realize that he's already died for you to pay the price, I want you to meet me down here at this altar and say, Lord, I thank you for dying for me. I need you, Jesus, in my life. I need you. I need you. I need you, Jesus. I need you. I need you. I give you my life. God, thank you for dying and taking the penalty. Thank you, God, for suffering for me. Thank you for taking away everything that I did wrong. He's made you righteous. He's made you righteous. But you come and receive it. You got to come and receive it. You got to come and receive it. He died for you. He died for you. He took your place. He took your place. He took your place. Place he took your place, he took your addiction, he took your bad habits, he took your lying tongue, he took your pride, he took that arrogance, he took it, he took your deception, he took your heartbreak, he took all of the hurt that you caused other people. Jesus took it and died for it. He paid the price for you, he paid the price for you. People would scarcely die for a righteous person, but Jesus died for sinners. He died for people that missed the mark. He died for rebellious people. He died for wicked people. He died for dishonorable people. He died for disrespectful people. He died for alcoholics. He died for drug addicts. He died for sex addicts. He died for those that were addicted to pornography. He died for those that were involved in sexual immorality. He died for those suffering with pride. He died for those suffering with unforgiveness. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you. He changed places for you. He changed places with you. And I don't know about you, but I'm grateful. I'm thankful. I'm thankful. I just declare, Lord, I thank you for dying for me. Thank you for paying the price for me. Thank you for redeeming me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for watching me. Thank you for purging me. Thank you for sanctifying me. Thank you for healing me, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for renewing my mind with your word. Thank you, Lord, for allowing me to be filled with the embodiment of who you are. Thank you that your spirit fills me. Thank you that your word fills me. Thank you that your grace fills me. Thank you that your mercy fills me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you believe that he died for you, tell him thank you. Open your mouth and thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Give him glory. You were destined to hell. You deserved hell. God is your blessed redeemer today. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.